I just see it uh, as a beginning. Uh, not just this flight, but in this program, which has really been a very short piece of human history. The history of the Apollo 11 moon landing is replete with large figures. To take the first hesitant steps on an alien planet required eight years, 10 practice missions, more than 400,000 engineers, scientists, and technicians, and over 150 billion pounds in today's money. Billions of people around the world were awestruck by Neil Armstrong's moonwalk in 1969 and have been ever since. The American astronaut who walked on the moon for the first time on July 20th, 1969, aboard the Apollo 11 spacecraft, is once again the focus of widespread interest. Neil Armstrong became the embodiment of myth in later life, an enigma primed to be filled with meaning by others because he was such a solitary and contemplative man who was so difficult to know. Armstrong passed away in 2012, yet the stories and legends about him continue. Join us as we explore the legends and speculation surrounding Neil Armstrong's death and Apollo 11. On August 5, 1930, Neil Armstrong was born to Stephen Koenig Armstrong and Viola Louise Engel in Wapakoneta, Ohio. He fought as a naval aviator in the Korean War, which lasted from 1949 to 1952. He attended Purdue University as an undergrad and emerged with a B.S. in aeronautical engineering in 1955. After he had already become recognized around the world, he went back to school and earned a master's degree in aerospace engineering from USC in 1970. Neil Armstrong became a test pilot for NASA, then known as NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, and flew the X-15, a rocket-powered, missile-shaped aircraft that tested the limits of high-altitude flight. Over the course of his lengthy career, Armstrong piloted everything from jets to gliders to helicopters to test out new space technology on the two-seat Gemini missions and the three-seat Apollo missions that eventually landed 12 people on the moon's surface, Armstrong was chosen to join NASA's second set of astronauts in 1962. In March of 1966, Armstrong took command of the sixth crewed mission of the Gemini program. In May of 1968, while piloting the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle, a craft that could fly similarly to a lunar module and mimic landings on the moon, Armstrong almost missed a devastating accident within Earth's atmosphere. NASA stated that Armstrong was forced to eject from the spacecraft seconds before it crashed, due to a lack of fuel for the orientation thrusters. Armstrong managed to avoid injury. In January of 1969, it was revealed who would make up Apollo 11's crew. Astronaut Office Chief Donald Kent Deke Slayton assembled a trio of seasoned space explorers with Armstrong, Gemini 8, Edwin Buzz Aldrin, Gemini 12, and Michael Collins, Gemini 10, as the lead crew. A lot of hard work went into getting Neil Armstrong and the rest of the Apollo 11 crew ready to take that small step for a man on the moon on July 20, 1969. NASA had the astronauts do things like collect geological specimens and practice getting in and out of the lunar module to help them develop the muscle memory they would need to perform these tasks on the moon without the benefit of formal training. The team made their training as realistic as possible by visiting locations on Earth that closely resembled the lunar landscape. Since nobody had ever traveled to the moon, NASA had to find areas that had geological properties that were fairly equivalent. The astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins did a lot of field work in the American Southwest, specifically in Arizona, Texas, and Nevada, but they also traveled far throughout the country and even abroad. They went through extensive training at a wide variety of locations to prepare for the wide range of geological features they would encounter. NASA wanted the astronauts to have the procedures ingrained in their muscle memory so that they wouldn't have to spend a lot of time thinking about how to take a sample or a photo, so they had a mix of classroom training and field training. The astronauts had enough on their plates, and it was more important that they return home safely than that the samples and images be analyzed by scientists on Earth. 
The astronauts trained extensively on Earth to become accustomed to the task of collecting and analyzing rock and soil samples using their hands and small shovels. They also simulated things like choosing where to dig trenches and collect samples, driving core tubes into the ground to collect samples, describing geological features orally and in writing, photographing sites, and correctly labeling the samples they collected. After the success of the Apollo missions, NASA made analog missions a standard part of astronaut training for future spaceflight. Lunar analogs are described as regions on Earth that are utilized to imitate the July 1969, Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Edwin Buzzes Aldrin were still here on Earth. They were doing final inspections inside the tiny Columbia Command Module. No roomier than the interior of a large car, Columbia would serve as their home throughout the journey. The Saturn V rocket, on which this module rode, was 111 meters in height. The Saturn V was a three-stage rocket that was the most powerful ever launched. When the fuel in each stage was gone, the stage would break away from the rocket. After that, the rocket's next stage engines would fire and it would continue on its way into space. The rocket's first stage ignited and lifted off from Cape Kennedy at 9.32 a.m. local time. This phase focused on supplying power to accomplish the difficult operation of lifting the massive spacecraft off the ground. It burned through a whopping 40,000 pounds of fuel every second of its liquid hydrogen and oxygen mixture. However, it served its purpose, lifting the astronauts to a height of 42 miles in just over two and a half minutes, thanks to its 7.5 million pounds force. The second stage began once the first ended. This was ignited and kept burning for six minutes, allowing the rocket to reach an altitude of 109 miles and speeds approaching orbital velocity. In under 2.5 minutes, the rocket's third and final stage fired, propelling the astronauts into Earth orbit at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour. Apollo 11's third stage refired for another six minutes after making one and a half orbits of the Earth. This propelled the spacecraft toward the moon. Once it had separated, just the Columbia's command module remained with the astronauts inside. The Eagle lunar module, which was used to land on the moon, was, however, part of this lost third stage. Since the Eagle lunar module could not be extracted from its storage compartment without docking with it in space, the astronauts faced a difficult challenge. When they finally linked Eagle and Columbia together, less than five hours had passed since liftoff. Three more days would pass before the astronauts could set foot on the moon. The astronauts used this downtime to refuel, rest, and snap some photos. They used the same telescope and sextant that sailors would have used hundreds of years ago to make sure they were heading in the right direction. Both the command module and the lunar module of the Apollo spacecraft were hurtling toward the moon at a speed of about 24,000 miles per hour. It's equivalent to six miles per second. The astronauts couldn't afford to wait even a second for the results of their calculations if they intended to land in the correct location on the moon. The real-time computers on board the Apollo spacecraft occupied less than one cubic foot of space, a remarkable engineering and programming achievement in an era when even batch processing equipment required entire rooms. What would not be familiar was the inertial guidance system, which featured accelerometers that picked up any shift in the spaceship's velocity or orientation, and the onboard computer into which the astronauts input their data. This computer was really primitive in comparison to what we have now. The astronauts had to feed it code via punch cards, and it was no more powerful than a pocket calculator. Despite its flaws, the navigational precision and command it afforded made it possible to reach the moon and return. The Apollo 11 spacecraft entered lunar orbit after touching down on the moon. Collins, aboard Columbia, witnessed Armstrong and Aldrin's undocking and moon landing aboard Eagle on the spacecraft's third orbit around the moon. To hover above the lunar surface, the Eagle lunar module was equipped with a descent rocket engine. On July 20, 1969, guided by a landing radar, Armstrong semi-manually piloted an Eagle utilizing four clusters of rockets to land in the Sea of Tranquility. Armstrong took one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, four hours later. 
The A was masked by radio static, but sound wave analysis later confirmed that Armstrong had said it. During their two hour and 36 minute moonwalk together, Armstrong and Aldrin were able to explore the lunar surface. They deployed experiments, planted the American flag, and had a brief conversation with the United States then president, Richard Nixon, as well as brought back 48.5 pounds of surface samples, including 50 moon rocks. Neil Armstrong and Colonel Aldrin left a plaque on the moon that read, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. July 1969, A.D., we came in peace for all mankind. Eagle, Armstrong, and Aldrin's home on the moon for 21.5 hours was built with the intention that it would never return to Earth. There were two sections to it. That bottom gold and black bit was the descent stage, or final segment. For the first steps on the moon, its contents included the rocket engine, fuel, scientific instruments, exploration gear, and a ladder. Ascension stage, the silver and black upper part, was crucial to the astronauts' safety. Electronics, the main rocket, and smaller rocket clusters were all stored there, as well as the pressurized compartment and escape door the crew required to leave the lunar surface and reconnect with Columbia. During launch, this part of Eagle broke off from the descent stage, leaving that portion of the spacecraft stuck on the moon. On Columbia's 27th orbit around the moon, the other half of Eagle docked with it. Because of this, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins were all together again on the Columbia. After the ascent stage was discarded into space, it would eventually crash onto the moon at an undetermined point. The Columbia rocket needed only to be fired for about 2.5 minutes to send the astronauts on their way down to Earth. And then, only 44 hours after launch, they began re-entry preparations. They began the return to Earth by performing a deorbit burn on Columbia. Then the cone-shaped part of the rocket where the astronauts were sitting broke away from the rest of the rocket. They entered Earth's atmosphere after turning the module around so its heat shield was facing down. The heat barrier was gone in a flash, and the chutes opened seconds later. On July 24, 19, National Aeronautics and Space Administration has pondered the issue of moon dust. NASA was warned by astronomer Thomas Gold of Cornell University that the dust could be highly chemically reactive due to its long isolation from oxygen. Too much dust brought inside the lunar module's cabin could catch fire or possibly explode if the astronauts repressurized it with air and the dust came into touch with oxygen. Gold had warned NASA that the dust may be so deep that the lunar module and the astronauts themselves could sink irretrievably under it. He was right from the start that the moon's surface would be blanketed with powdery dust. Before taking off for the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin were briefed on the thousands of details they would need to remember, including the extremely remote risk that the lunar dust could catch fire. It was not a good idea to have a fireworks show on the moon in late July. Armstrong and Aldrin conducted their own experiment. In case the astronauts had to depart quickly without collecting rocks, Armstrong had already scooped up a small amount of lunar dirt and placed it in a sample bag, which he then tucked into a pocket of his spacesuit. The two opened the bag upon returning to the lunar module and dumped the lunar soil over the rocket boosters. They were keeping an eye on the ground to see if it caught fire as they repressurized the cabin. However, that did not occur. Since the dust from the moon was so persistent and bothersome, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin slept with their helmets and gloves on during the one night they spent in the lunar module on the lunar surface. After being exposed to air and moisture in their storage boxes, the moon rocks and dust that had been collected during the six lunar landings and weighing a total of 842 pounds had lost their odor by the time they were returned to Earth. Even though spent gunpowder smells nothing like moon rock, the source of the stench has yet to be determined. The astronauts underwent quarantine to reduce the unlikely possibility that they were bringing some kind of moon bugs back with them before setting out on a world tour to commemorate the trip. Neil Armstrong was careful after leaving the space program not to do anything that would diminish his legacy. Even though he was frequently in the public eye, he avoided interviews and media attention as much as possible. In the memoir, First Man, Dr. James Hansen says, 
Everyone gives Neil the greatest credit for not trying to take advantage of his fame, not like other astronauts have done. To which Janet Armstrong replies, Yes, but look what it's done to him inside. She continued, He certainly led an interesting life, but he feels guilty that he got all the credit for an effort that involved tens of thousands of people. But he took it all way too seriously. After leaving NASA, Armstrong largely avoided the public eye, emerging only for the occasional interview or commemorative event related to Apollo 11. The famous moonwalker had cardiac bypass surgery on August 7, 2012, just two days after he turned 82. His death on August 25th was a result of complications during surgery. After Neil Armstrong passed away at a hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, his loved ones issued a heartfelt homage to his millions of fans all over the world. Honor his example of time they saw the moon shining down at them on a clear night. Meanwhile, the family's reaction to his death at age 82 was much more heated behind closed doors. Neil Armstrong's two sons claimed that he died as a result of subpar postoperative care at Mercy Health, Fairfield Hospital. An independent expert hired by the hospital would reach the same conclusion. Although the hospital maintained its defense of the care provided, documents revealed that it paid the family $6 million to resolve the dispute discreetly and prevent potentially disastrous exposure. The allegations and payment were kept confidential at the hospital's insistence. Neil Armstrong's wife informed the Associated Press that he was amazingly resilient and strolling in the corridor after his bypass surgery in early August 2012. Then, he passed away on the 25th of August after nurses disconnected the wires from a temporary pacemaker, which had caused bleeding into the membrane surrounding the heart. Days after the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong's moonwalk prompted a flood of nostalgic media commemorating his feat, News of the medical debate and secret settlement emerged. The New York Times received 93 pages of data, including conflicting assessments by medical specialists for both sides, relating to the astronaut's care and the court issue, in the mail from an anonymous source. A handwritten message inside the envelope expressed the sender's sincere desire to help others by sharing this information. Neil Armstrong, who shied away from the spotlight and never cashed in on his reputation, has a tragic epilogue because of the court settlement. Confidential settlements in liability cases, such as those involving medical malpractice, are widespread but contentious since they shield reputations but prevent public accountability. Despite this, Neil Armstrong's family claimed in the statement that he remained a supporter of aviation and exploration throughout his life and never lost his childlike wonderment of these activities reflecting the remarkable public praise that came to a very private man tributes and remembrances began appearing online almost immediately after the news of his death was publicized we honor the life of a magnificent man who has passed away and hope that his example will inspire young people everywhere to pursue their passions travel the world and give their all to causes larger than themselves Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.